Hello, everybody. How are you handling today? Like, first of all, thanks a lot for being here. I know these are like really hard times. I, I expect you are staying at home with the people you love and staying safe. This is one of the most important things today. And um, it's, these are terrible times. And uh, what I wanted to do today is basically tell you what you can do in your free time, how you can contribute to Magento 2 as an open source initiative. But I also want to talk to you mostly because I don't want you to feel alone. I don't want you to feel unsafe. And this is a great community. And to be honest, I, most, I, I, I almost know most of you. Like I've been to India three or four times already. Every time there's a Mid Magento event, I'm there. And I, and I know you and I really like working with you and I don't, I don't want you to feel alone. So I'm really happy you were able to join today. Uh, let, me, let me share my screen real quick. So you can, you can see my screen and we'll start. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can make it. Perfect. Okay, can you see my screen now? Perfect. Okay, we're good. So basically what I'm gonna be talking about today is how to maintain an open source project. Now, I'm not gonna introduce myself. Most of you already know me. My name is Miguel Valparda. I'm a Magento Master and a Product Manager for Nexus. And for the last five or six years, I've been traveling a lot and I've been also helping the community engineering team to maintain Magento 2. Now, to start, let me show you some of the open source initiatives you use every day. Now, of course, there's Magento, Apache. They have a really good Apache software foundation where they, they put different softwares like PongaP, even the Apache software we use to, to run web servers. MariaDB, that's something we are using as a database engine. Linux is, of course, an open source project. Microsoft.net is actually a really interesting open source project you all use every day, which is coming from Microsoft a company that, that, that wasn't an open source company, but now these days after the acquisition of GitHub, they become more and more open source friendly and they even have their own repositories on GitHub. And there's also OpenSSL, which is well, one, of the, one of the softwares we use in our web servers too. Now, what is an open source project and why is better than proprietary code or, or like why is different than a closer to project? Now, an open source project can be modified by anyone. What does this mean? You can go right now on github.com slash Magento slash Magento 2 and submit a pull request. That means you can actually go and code your own solution to a problem you're having on Magento. That, this also includes any other software. But it's important to understand an open source project can be modified by anyone. What's the difference between this and a proprietary code? Well, let's say you have, I don't know, Microsoft Office. That's a piece of software we all use but that's not a piece of software anybody can modify. Now, you see the difference? Now, this also means you have access to the source code. What does this mean for you? For me, for me, it means I can actually go and see how Magento implemented something. Let's say I want to implement something in the checkout. Now, in a, in a closed source project, you, you won't have any ideas about how Magento is doing the checkout, but when it comes to Magento 2 and an open source project, you can just go and check how is Magento doing this in the checkout? I have no idea, but I can go on GitHub and be like, okay, let me check this file. I want to see how they are loading this model in particular. And then you can see how others are using the code. And that's why it's important to have access to the source code. Now, when you have access to the source code, that means you have a better grasp on its features and functionality. Again, if you wanna see how Magento is implementing something, you can just go into GitHub and be like, okay, I wanna check how Magento is doing this banner. I want to check how Magento is doing this model. I want to see how Magento is doing this blog. And then you have a better grasp on the features and how it's implemented internally. And one of the best things I, I like about Magento 2 is that we have transparency in technical decisions. Let's say tomorrow we want to, I don't know, stop supporting Apache and only support Nginx. Now, that might be something that happens, that might be, that, that might not happen in the future, but let's say we want to try that. Now, there's gonna be a proposal in Magento, in github.com slash Magento slash architecture, where the architects of Magento are gonna propose something we want to do with the software in the future. And us, as a community, as an ecosystem, we'll be able to vote whether if that proposal is gonna happen or not. And that's extremely important because when you, when you are a part of the decisions, you, you actually understand why that decision was made in the first place. And also you feel a part of something bigger, something that people sometimes 
want to feel when they work in an open source project. And these are, in my opinion, the biggest difference between an open source project and proprietary code. Now, even a small developer can find a way to help millions of others. This is a really interesting thing to understand when you code something that's open source. You might be coding a solution for you. You are having a problem in, in the customer registration and you'll be like, okay, I'm gonna fix this for me, for my project. But then Magento 2 is used by millions of developers, by millions of customers buying online. So when you fix that little thing you found in the customer registration, when you fix that little thing you found in the checkout, you're actually fixing that for everybody, not only for you, but for every developer that's using Magento 2. And that's really important because by doing something really small, you can help millions of others. And that's one of the things I like the most about open source, if you ask me. Now, let's talk about Magento 2, because here, that's what we all do here. When was the last time you worked in a team with 1,300 contributors? That's the number we have in Magento. That's the number of people we have working in this repository. Now, this leads to a lot of problems. This is a huge team. There's a lot of people working here, and it's not only people from like India or from Argentina. This is people from all around the globe working on the same piece of software, and that for for us to make that happen, we need to be extremely careful. You need to understand we are working with different people from all around the globe, and they have different, they have different backgrounds, they have different cultures, they have different work ethics, everything is different. And yet, we found a way to make this work, so everybody is welcome to collaborate here. But again, you need to understand you are working with a team of 1,300 developers. That's a lot of people working on the same thing. So, you need to be clear, you need to be extremely communicative. If you don't understand something, it might be because of cultural differences. So don't, don't assume anything. Just, just come here with the best humor and try to work with us because this is a really friendly team, but this is a huge team also. And you need to understand there are limitations around contributing only because it's complicated to have 1,300 people working on the same product every day. So keep that in mind. Now, we have around 400 pull requests open today. This is, this is a screenshot I took today. So this is like up to date. We have 400 pull requests open. Now that's a lot. We have 1,200 issues open. That's also a lot. But I'm gonna be explaining you the differences between issues and pull requests in a moment. But again, I need you to understand this is a huge project. And while we have quite a few developers working in the community engineering team to try to maintain this, it has proven to be extremely complicated. So I'm gonna give you some advices on how to contribute and how to make it easier for us to accept your contributor, your contributor, your contribution, sorry. Now, let me show you this real quick. This is actually me. So far I processed around 300 pull requests to be exact, 298. I have 293 closed and five open. I'm working on those five pull requests. But it's, this, is what I'm, this is what I've been doing for the last two years, and I'm, I'm really proud of this number, so that's why I wanted to show you this. Now, let me, show, let me tell you what's, what an issue is. The practical definition of an issue is that this is the best way to tell a core developer about a problem, an improvement, or a feature. Now, let's say you are, we have experienced a problem. Let's say you have problems in your checkout. Let's say you have problems in your customer registration. The first thing you need to do here is try to see if anybody else is having the same problem you're having. You might ask why? It, well, mostly because we've been working with this software for, year now, for years now and chances are somebody else already had the same issue you're having. And that means there's a, probably a solution for the issue you're having. So that's why you should, be, you should be trying to see if there's something reported before opening a pull request. But let's say you can't find anything. Let's say you found a problem in Magento 2 that nobody else has. Now, an issue is gonna be the best way to tell me or any other code developer you are having an issue. Now, anyone can answer an issue. It doesn't have to be me. That it doesn't have to be a community maintainer. It doesn't have someone, it doesn't have to be someone from Magento. Anyone can answer an issue. It means if you're having an issue and I have a solution, I, I, will, I will be like, okay, this is a solution I have for your issue. Now, an issue is not a place to scream at developers. This might seem really obvious, but there are many issues where people insult us. Like they scream at us, they tell me, hey, I need this to be fixed now or, or else I'm gonna kill you. And I'm like, what? That doesn't make any sense. 
and yet it happens a lot. So when I tell you there might be cultural differences, there might be things we don't understand from people working on the other side of the world in the same project we are working. That means don't assume anything. Don't assume somebody is insulting you, but please, please don't do that. Like, you don't have to be an asshole to work on open source. You have to be a really nice person because most of us are doing this in our free time and we are also persons. So I don't want to be screamed. I don't want to be jailed at, and I don't want to be asked, when is this product? When is this issue gonna be closed? When is this pull request gonna be merged? Because I don't know, I don't even have the answer to that. And sometimes it, it, feels, it feels terrible. So please, please don't take an issue as a place to scream at the developer. Now, an issue is an open source project equivalent to a ticket. Let's say we want to compare an open source project with the project we are working in your office, in your everyday work. Now, when you have a problem, you, you create an issue, you create a ticket. When you have a problem on open source, you create an issue on GitHub. That's the way this works. Now, the needs of many outweighs the need of the few. What does this mean? There are times where we, we are faced with the, with the dilemma on pull requests. Sometimes we don't know if the solution is, is good or not that good, but there are times we need to decide. And we are always gonna be deciding for the majority and not only for like an edge case, for a case where only you are having your particular setup. So keep this in mind when you submit an issue. Keep this in mind when you submit a pull request. There are times where your pull request is gonna be rejected. There are times where your pull request is gonna be accepted, but that depends on a lot of factors. And one of the factors that I'm talking about is basically we need to understand how your pull request or how your issue impacts on a greater audience. How does your fix impact on everybody, on every person that's using Magento? And that's one of the things you need to understand when you code something. You need to think about this because this is not gonna be used only by you, but this is gonna be used by many people. And you don't want to break everybody's installation that just to make yours work. Now, let's talk about pull requests. Creating a pull request is pretty simple. First of all, you need to fork the repository in your account. This is basically, this is basically done by clicking fork on the top right on GitHub. Basically, this is gonna create an exact copy of the repository you are trying to work on on your personal GitHub account. So if this is github.com slash Magento slash Magento2, this is gonna be now github.com slash Miguel Valparda slash Magento2. And that's gonna be an exact copy of the Magento2 repository in my own account. Now, after that, I can go and do the changes and push them to GitHub. Basically, I'm gonna be fixing the thing I wanna fix, create the feature I wanna create, and push that to my own account. Now, after all, after that, you have to open a pull request and point it to Devil. What does it mean pointing it to Devil? We don't merge pull requests that are pointing to master. Most of the pull requests are gonna be merged in the, in the Devil branch first and then move to master when we do a release. This is important. If you don't do that, your pull request is gonna be closed or we will have to modify your pull request to make it point to Devil. Now, you need to check it if the tests are passing. This is really important. And we created quite a few tests in Magento 2 that are automatically run once you create a pull request. If you don't have the test passing, your pull request is not gonna be merged. And that's something you need to take into consideration because there are a lot of people that create pull requests, but they don't care about the testing. And I'm like, yeah, this is mandatory. You don't, you don't get to choose. You just have to submit your code, create the tests for them, and basically be like, okay, all the tests are passing. Can you check my pull request now? And now after that, we are gonna revise your pull request. And if it's, and if it's working, we're, we're, you're, we are gonna merge it. Now, once we do that, congratulations, you are a contributor. And that means your code is gonna be forever in the Magento 2 repository, which is actually a really big merit and an honor if you ask me. I really like having my code in Magento 2. It feels, it feels I'm, being, I'm being a part of something bigger and it feels really good if you ask me. So give it a try, yeah. Now, let me show you how a good pull request looks like. A couple of years ago, I was working in Magento 2%, which is one of the most used extensions to integrate Varnish and Magento 1. And Alan Storm sent me a pull request. Now, I was really impressed because this pull request had, had everything I needed. Like it has a technical explanation, it has the problem they were trying to solve. They have the solution they were trying to, to, to use. And then they, it was the code. The code was perfect. The code was well commented. So 
this pull request was accepted real quick, mostly because it was a really good one, a really good pull request, and it was extremely complete. If you want your code to be accepted, I would say you should be trying to do something like this. You should be trying to explain the problem you're having, explain the context where you are experiencing that problem, explain the solution you found, and comment the code and do the tests. That's, that's the way to have your pull request approved. Now, issues are problems and suggestions. Pull requests are solutions. Now, let's talk, let's talk about the license we have for Magento, 3, for Magento 2. This is important and most of you probably know this already, but Magento 2 uses OSL version 3. That means you can sub-license, modify, distribute, and use that for commercial use, but you cannot use the trademark or hold the company liable. Now, there are things you must do. You must, let's say you modify Magento 2 and you want to redistribute this. You must disclose the source. You must include the copyright and you must include the license when it comes to redistributing work you have done over Magento 2. Now, this is really technical and it's not that important, but it's always worth mentioning which is the license a particular open source project is operating within because licenses are hard licenses are different between each other, and this one in particular is pretty clear. Sorry, okay, here we go. Okay, so I'm, I'm about to finish this presentation. We are, we are coming to the part where we talk about different Magento projects you can collaborate with. Magento 2 is not the only project you can help with on GitHub. There are many projects out there, and one of the projects I like the most is DevDocs. Magento, most of you were working in Magento 1 when Magento 2 was launched. And one of the things we all knew that we we're going to get better was the documentation. You all know how the documentation used to look like in Magento 1. Now we have DevDocs. And it's really important for us to collaborate in that project because that's the best way to keep our project and documentation up to date. And it works just like Magento 2 on GitHub. You create, you fork the repo, you do the changes, and then you submit the pull request. There are many things to work on. Um, this is, these are some of the useful links I found. So far we talk about github.com slash Magento slash Magento 2, github.com slash Magento slash DevDocs. But if you want to work on something else, you can always go to opensource.magento.com or to community.magento.com where you're gonna find the forum. Everybody's working on something these days. I know people have a lot of free time. So I would say one of the best things you can do during this quarantine is try to collaborate with any open source project. It doesn't have to be Magento. If there's a project you know and you use, it's always good to try to be a part of the ecosystem, to try to be a part of that community and to give something back. Because to be honest, we are all making money out of Magento and it feels, it feels like the right thing to do to give something back. And that's what I try to do. I know I'm, I'm making money out of Magento developments. So what about if I go on GitHub and help people who's actually struggling? How about if I go there and help people who's having issues? And that's, it, it's really good. Like it feels great. It feels great helping people. And that's one of the things I like the most about contributing to an open source project. Now, I think we have some time. I'm pretty sure I have like five or 10 more minutes. So ask me anything. What, do you have any questions about contributing to Magento 2? Do you have any questions about Magento 2 performance? It's, I think we have time. So how about you drop your questions on chat and we can see if, if anybody has an answer. Okay, I have questions. I have a question here. So Srivats is asking, could you give an example of what kind of tests are running? Of course, give me one second. Let me show you, I'm gonna share my screen again real quick. Here we go. Okay, so you were asking about what kind of tests we are, we are running, but this is pretty simple. If you go to any pull request, you're gonna find this. Sorry. Here. Now, these are all the tests we run in any pull request. Now, we have functional testing, we have integration testing, we have B2B enterprise edition testing, static tests, unit tests. All the tests are here. 
Now, every time you submit a pull request, every time you change something in that pull request, this is gonna be running. This might take a while, some of these tests might fail, but if you don't know how to fix them, if you have any questions, you can just ping me or ping any of the maintainers working on that ticket, and we'll try to help you. It's usually pretty easy. It's, it's, it usually takes a day or two to make this work, so don't be afraid. If you don't know how to make this work, just ask us, because again, it, it's pretty easy. Vivek is asking how to contribute to enterprise-only modules. So <laughs> this is not that simple. There are ways to contribute, but one, you have to be a partner, and two, you have to have access to the enterprise or like the Magento 2 commerce GitHub repo. I have access, I can go and contribute, but it's not for everybody. It, it, I think it's only for, for Magento partners. I'm not entirely sure, so I'm, I don't work for Magento, so I'm not entirely sure, sorry about that. I, I see there's there's another question asking where we can find details on new projects being brought up on GitHub. Now, this is gonna be opensource.magento.com. Most of the things are, are listed there. There are new projects that might not have all the information, but it's, I think most of the information you want is on opensource.magento.com. You can even join the Slack channel where we, where we talk about these projects and new things we're working on. I think there's a link on opensource.magento.com. I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, uh, let me find some more questions. Is there any interesting link that you can share for test cases? I would say, yeah. Every little test is here. I'm gonna, let me, Let me show you real quick a link to to all the to all the tests we have here. Here are all the tests we have. So Shashid Hari is asking me which environment is best used for Magento, Docker or something else. I'm I work for a hosting company. I work for Nexus. We do Magento Cloud. Now I would say you should be using something that is managed. Let's say Nexus Cloud, let's say Magento Cloud, but it, it has to be managed. It doesn't make any sense to create something from scratch to host your own thing on AWS because you have to maintain that actually. And it doesn't make a lot of sense because it costs money, it costs time, and people don't, <laughs> we keep seeing people that's asking us, hey, can you manage my site for me? And I'm gonna tell you, sure, I can do that. But the question is, do you have sysadmins working for you? Do you have anyone with the experience to manage a web server? And the answer is usually no. And that's why I would recommend anybody doing Magento to use managed hosting and not something you create from scratch. <laughs> How to become a Magento master? I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I've been traveling, I've been working, I've been doing the events, I just, I just enjoy doing what I do. And I think becoming a Magento master shouldn't be the end goal, but the journey, the journey to become a Magento master is, is quite interesting. Like you get to meet a lot of people, you get to work on a lot of stuff, but you also have to, to support quite a few, quite a few problems. So it's, it's not that easy. Okay, do you have any more questions? I think, Jennifer, I think we're good. We have quite a few questions. Yeah. I, I replied all of them. Let me. Yes, Michael. So uh, I think, uh, guys, you can just keep asking questions and using this Q&A tab. So you can post your questions. I, I'm sure uh, Miguel will be getting back to your questions. And Miguel, thank you so much for the session. It was very nice. It was very, very informative uh, on handling the open source. So thank you so much for being here, for taking this time for us. Thank you, Miguel, for such an uh, enlightening session. It was really very nice. And uh, thank you for bringing out all of those things. And uh, and all of those who want to contribute, I think uh, Miguel is the person to look up to. He has been uh, there for the community since long. And, and uh, it is he who has inspired many others to come and contribute to the, uh, to the ecosystem. And he rightly said one thing that 
we all are earning in a way or the other from uh, uh, we all are earning from in a way or the other from magento and it is it is kind of our moral duty to give it back to the community in all the ways possible and uh, that is what i try to do and uh, uh, i hope you guys can see my screen right i am i am visible to you guys right yes we can see you because... perfect so uh, anyone uh, who is posting on chat i'm sorry i would not be able to see the chat messages because i am going to take you through the introduction about adobe commerce cloud that is what i'm going to present to you today and um, i think um, in terms of introduction jennifer has already given whatever uh, needs to be done uh, needs to be given right so i'll take you through the presentation it would be more of a uh, highlight or a very high level introduction about adobe commerce cloud this has been a question to magento community more often as what adobe is going to do with magento and uh, this is one thing which it has done with magento um, there is a product offering now called adobe commerce cloud so my um, my presentation would be around these five uh, topics that i'm going to take you through so where we are today, uh, if you see, this is the global uh, e-commerce market and um, the, the US market uh, in terms of the spending. And these are uh, numbers from 2019. I know COVID have actually impacted all of us in a way or the other. And um, obviously there are some surge happening in the e-commerce market of which we uh, which we see happening. But but where we are currently, if we see, we are currently dealing with web web stores. We are dealing with catalogs, mass personalization, site driven. When we talk about the customers, and where we want to go, we want to go into a shoppable experience. We want to go into a curated product presentation, exclusive experience, content driven, uh, based on the customer needs. In terms of the businesses, um, the the B, the kind of the businesses that we see for now is mostly around B two B C A business or B two C business or B two B two C business, but the future is about P two P people to people or human to human kind of a uh, business wherein you are actually understanding each needs of a customer and giving them what they are actually looking for. Currently, we are dealing with one-time transition web distribution and stores, but we want to take it into a more of an omni-channel experience. We want to make it more from a business platform deliveries. In terms of the applications, if you see, um, we are more of a modular, uh, we are more of a monolithic, uh, we have mostly the, the more applications that are there, they are mostly monolithic uh, applications. They are helpful ex uh, applications wherein we are going to a, uh, world wherein we would have more of an hybrid applications, uh, which are more um, modular applications to come across. And if you see uh, the left side of the screen, where which says from is basically where we are currently, and two is where we want to take it. And how is that possible? If you deliver people an experience rather than delivering them a product, there are very high chances of the customer de demand getting high. So let's say if you are giving a customer a personalized experience, there's 65% more chance of getting the customer back on your website and purchase from your website. 1.4x in terms of the revenue growth that you can have. And we all know these numbers, uh, the load times and all. Um, I was just uh, seeing a presentation early this morning which said that uh, with 1% of a, a one second of a decrease in the uh, speed on Amazon and on and on um, um, what's called uh, Walmart or uh, yeah, there is around ten thousand dollars of revenue uh, increase or decrease that they see, and th these are some real numbers which we are seeing already in the globe happening across. And that is where Adobe Commerce Cloud comes into play, which actually says that we are here to make every experience shoppable and every experience personal and moment personal and experience shoppable. So what is the typical journey of a, uh, of a buyer? The buyer comes with a discovery phase and then does his research. The research, the, the discovery phase can be from any place, right? It, he can come from a um, Twitter ad or a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad, or maybe a magazine or maybe a website, maybe a mobile app, maybe WhatsApp, right? It can be anything. So discovery phase, research phase. Research phase is where the customer goes and tries to understand the product, as in what the product is, how the product is going to be, what would um, what would the product cost, or what is the advantage or a disadvantage of a product X compared to a product Y. 
and then comes the buy phase right the buy journey can be anything from it can be on laptop or it can be on mobile and that is where the omni channel or or omni device experience have to be in place and then the uh, the order status the pickup and the support uh, journey and that is where you basically that this is the high level journey of a customer and we will see how this journey is fulfilled by um, is fulfilled by um, by our experience driven platform so adobe commerce basically is a hybrid of four adobe products which is magento commerce target experience manager and analytics so this is what i when you say uh, adobe commerce cloud you basically are enrolling for these four product offering from adobe adobe target um, magento commerce i don't need to explain to anyone i am sure you guys are uh, familiar and know uh, much more than i do uh, target basically this is a real time customer profiling basically using this you can do a customer uh, uh, you can uh, you can put them into a different customer segments and you can personalize the journey uh, for their customer segments adobe experience this is a front end engine wherein uh, you can have aem as a front end engine uh, to make this a more more of a more of a what do we call it headless implementation and analytics this is to give you a more detailed input about how magento um, how your um, e-commerce store is behaving and how the things are so this is this is the high level implementation when i when we say about how different products are going to uh, work and when when adobe commerce cloud comes into play and when when a customer should enroll into an adobe commerce cloud uh, kind of an offering so if your customer is more from a b2b or a b2c side where with core commerce being the the focus area we go with magento commerce um, as the offering when there is a experience insight wherein basically the 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 customer wants to know what kind of products the customer uh, their customer is buy, is buying on the website and what uh, what are the different mm. analytics or touch point on the website uh, that is where the the inris exp insight experience uh, platform is recommended and the adobe commerce cloud is recommended when there when content is driving the commerce so we need to understand uh, the the utilization of adobe commerce cloud so it is very important to understand which offering has to go uh, to which customer at which point because then based on your recommendation the customer is going to have his solution in place so when a when a content is driving the commerce that is when the adobe commerce cloud comes into play and when you are actually thinking about the 360 degree experience of a customer not just the commerce piece when you want to have a 360 degree contact with the customer and and be with them always deliver them their personalized experience that is where the adobe commerce cloud comes into play this architecture is a very high level architecture uh, um, representative architecture this is not something to be taken as it is when we talk about adobe commerce cloud but if you see the customer interface the customer and the digital experience and the content is being driven by adobe commerce cloud uh, adobe experience manager magento sits uh, within inside it it can be a headless implementation it can be a hybrid implementation based on the requirements and the kind of the thing that uh, we want to do and then the crm integration the analytics integration the erp integration uh, the the target integration all of these can ha uh, will happen with magento and to adobe experience so target basically since it tracks and personalize the customer it would be talking to a to the front end uh, framework which is the adobe experience manager and the other things would be interacting with magento only if you can see from the the representative diagram that we have over here and again this is not the um, the the main uh, architecture for it. it this is just a representative ar architecture to let you know how this adobe commerce cloud works with magento and other interfaces so magento we all know about it and uh, migul rightly said uh, this is one of the largest community and uh, i think this is one of the best community that we have wherein people um, like migul and many other come up front and um, they are actually supporting the community in in all the forms possible so these are some of the logos that we have or some of the clients that we have and uh, we all know the in, uh, internet retailer top 1000 rankings we have been topping that since last 7 8 years now 
um, and uh, we know about the numbers of extensions and all and i'll not give those numbers you can just see on the screen but yeah we are a very strong community and i'm very proud of being part of this community so again with the, in terms of uh, some of the customers that we have so if you see the uh, the boxes at the bottom that speaks about how different uh, customers are taking magento and doing their um, uh, getting different things from the magento and other things so hp if i have to say has a global rollout with around um, around 15 different countries on a single magento uh, installation which we call as a uh, gra in our magento world and then uh, um, then nestle with uh, b2 uh, b2c and uh, b2b uh, universal music with um, 150 plus artists selling their own merchandising and and a lot of things that we do airbnb uh, air airbnb so this is more of a, a beverage website maybe many of you would relate this is a company um, that that produces uh, corona beer and a lot of other beer so this was one of the very first company that was selling beer online uh, more of, more from the b2b side but yeah we have done a lot of things uh, on magento so i'll just take um, one minute of yours to share a video with you all um, just to just give me a second i need to double check the video sharing settings if i have done it properly um, video settings uh, da -da -da. okay guys if you don't mind i'll just stop my screen sharing for a minute and i'll reshare it right because i want you guys to see this video and this would give you a very good example about how um, how this uh, experience driven commerce works share uh, this is very strange because I and uh, yeah okay okay perfect no not that strange perfect okay so I'm here I'll just uh, play a video for you guys and that will give you some more details about experience driven commerce um, here you go this video will follow a hypothetical experience built with Adobe experience uh, I hope you are able to hear the voice. I have just paused yes, the video. Yes, okay, perfect. Can. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Experience platform as seen from the perspective of a customer. Sarah Rose is a fitness and yoga enthusiast and attends group yoga lessons at Luma Yoga Studio. Occasionally, she buys new gear at the Luma store. Let's see how experience platform creates a rich, relevant, and real-time experience. While browsing on the Luma website, Sarah sees a sport shirt she likes and adds it to her cart. A cookie from the website is used to track her preferences. Sarah then receives an offer to register for a customer account using her Luma Studio membership. Her new account enables Experience Platform to link together her email, gym membership, and Experience Cloud identities in her real-time customer profile. This information allows Experience Platform to add Sarah to a segment representing studio members. Unfortunately, life gets busy and Sarah abandons her cart. Later, Sarah is sent an email recommending her to install the Luma app on her mobile device. She installs the app and signs in with her membership credentials. Now, Experience Platform links the mobile identity to Sarah's profile. Based on her studio membership and recent visits, including data loaded from the studio's member registration system and the catalog of available lessons, the platform determines that Sarah should receive a suggestion. Sarah receives an invite to the Luma Studio for a yoga session. She also gets the same offer as a push notification on the Luma app. When Sarah arrives at the studio, she checks in for the lesson and is greeted by a host who sees Sarah's profile. In this case, Experience Platform has combined Sarah's loyalty data with her online browsing behavior to present her with a suitable offer. Sarah is pleased and feeling good about the whole experience. She buys the shirt. The purchase is recorded and Sarah is sent a thank you message. Experience Platform made Sarah's customer journey easy, personal, and successful. Throughout this example, all of Sarah's interactions with Luma are strictly governed with respect to Sarah's privacy and preferences. We've now shown what Adobe Experience Platform looks like from Sarah's point of view.
yeah so that was a quick video that i wanted to show so this video okay video done great so <laughs> so in this video if you see what what is happening right sarah the the art uh, the imaginary character of the video wanted something right so that was the awareness and uh, the the customer had a need right then they went into a discovery phase so mostly what happens with an e-commerce store is that a customer with a need might not purchase at the right time but if they come to your store with a need on a discovery phase and if you are not able to capture them uh, from your business standpoint there are very high chances of losing them right because we all know there are many stats that we have read across which says if a customer do not uh, if you are not able to show a customer what he needs within 3 to 5 second he will always go to some another website to buy it right they may go to google they may go anywhere or just like in in this example uh, maybe your dog can um, can distract them maybe something in the household can distract them and that is where you need to capture the customers experience uh, customer and be able to segment them in your website so that you can offer them the shopping functionality of your website then convert them into a purchase cycle and then the post purchase cycle so in this example if i recall the example the the character wanted a t-shirt they went to a website registered but they could not buy the uh, buy the t-shirt the website was able to capture the need and it actually segmented the customer into a sec into a, a user segment called yoga or let's say health enthusiast and then started pushing the content related to health health enthusiast to that particular customer in this case Uh, the customer was pushed with a content uh, saying that there is a free yoga class near to her home and the customer went there the customer when she went there she registered over there the on the registration cycle uh, the re, the store owner uh, the the person in the store was able to know that the the customer was, uh, was looking for a store uh, yoga t-shirt and he was able to give some discount and make the purchase happen so if 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 you are not binding your offline journey and your online journey and not making it a full fledged customer experience journey you are not bound to uh, you are bound to lose all these leads and that is where uh, we say that th that if you are if you are able to make your customer properly aware about the brands you are going to have 1.6x more uh, chances of having revenue uh, brand awareness which increases to 1.9 of average order value 1.6x the customer lifetime customer retention and 36% faster growth rate so with that in keeping the earlier experience in mind we have actually segmented uh, the customer journey into five uh, broader verticals which is basically personalization personalized marketing and merchandising which actually means that you need to understand your customer's personal need give them a personalized marketing and then merchandising based on their needs rich omni channel experience you need to be able to connect all the customer touch points right it it can be offline it can be online it can be a facebook journey it can be an instagram journey optimize commerce process we always say that the commerce has to be frictionless commerce because if you allow a customer to think a lot on the or while they are doing a commerce uh, journey you are bound to lose them and that is where you might have seen uh, some of the old folks like me uh, might remember that in the older days of magento 1 we we used to have header and footer on the checkout and the cart pages as well a cart and the checkout pages mostly on the checkout pages but now they have gone right so that is a learning that we have all gained from uh, the uh, the idea of having less friction for a customer to buy a product intelligent and predictive um, data for the customer and uh, with that i think um, all of you might be aware if not just let me share this that now um, magento commerce is a la is actually having a native integration with uh, uh, with with adobe sensei and uh, product recommendation is actually part of it very soon or let's say some some time down the line the search is also going to be part of it which actually gives a very high insight 
to the store owner to pro to give a very dedicated uh, product offering to their customer and flexible and scalable we all know that right the business has to be flexible and scalable we should be able to have multiple global uh, rollouts multiple dope deployment multi brand multi currency and all of those things so this particular slide basically speaks about that only in a very high level so the journey can be headless hybrid full experience or off site with off site what do you mean by off site it can be a journey that can start from a mobile phone or it can start from a smart watch or from a text message or let's say from a um, from a pos service or maybe an email that can be a journey that can start from it so if you see this uh, slide it speaks about the personalization speaks about first segmenting the customer then marketing them uh, them based on their segments and then merchandising and search producing the results based on these segments that they are in and then um, the seg the second segment speaks about rich omnichannel experience which is wherein the experience of the content should drive the commerce the 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 content should be very dynamic and rich omnichannel and headless so basically we are going from a uh, the commerce is going towards a headless journey and uh, the need for it is because uh, you you want to deliver a very robust user experience or a customer experience to the customer right similarly we have optimized commerce processes wherein there are multiple distribution and management cycle fulfillment cycles business intelligence we have all um, spoken about it maybe the adobe sensei and experience driven and um, and all of those things right and flexible and scalable uh is wherein you can have multiple uh, like like something like magento commerce Cl uh, commerce cloud or adobe commerce cloud which gives you 99.99% uh, uh, scalability and and uptime we all know about this as well so we are actually moving from a uh, uh, more from a monolithic structure to a microservices uh, based or modularity based structure and that is why you are seeing a lot of changes coming across in magento ecosystem uh, to uh, the another uh, announcement maybe you might have uh, heard is that uh, from 2.4 onwards the the payment gateways which were actually part of the uh, earlier magento builds are going to be um, uh, removed from the core magento offering and the major the the payment gateway should have uh, should be installed using the extensions of the payment gateway so these are these are small steps that we are taking and maybe uh, migul will agree to that uh, whatever we are trying to do is to is to take our system to a more of a modular um, system and a modular architecture so that it is easier for everyone to use it and scale it GraphQL. Um, I really wanted to talk about it, and uh, the next slide would um, also highlight why. This is something that uh, you have to focus if you are not. Um, this is the um, this is the future uh, wherein we are trying to take uh, most of the integration, and this is uh, going to play a very important role in terms of the headless implementations that we are trying to do uh, with Magento and uh, Magento and Adobe Commerce Cloud and such. So there. Adobe Commerce Cloud's headless experience delivery. So this this slides basically speaks about how we are trying to um, fulfill all the journeys that um, a customer needs in terms of the headless experience that they are going to do. Uh, I already spoke about Adobe Sensei GraphQL and REST APIs are going to be uh, there. They're not going to go away unless everything comes on a in an ideal world. Everything starts to come from GraphQL until and unless REST APIs are going to be there. So this slide uh, is basically speaking about how we envision a um, headless journey using Adobe Experience uh, Manager. So there are six type of headless journeys that can be there. Um, six type of commerce journey, not headless journey, six type of commerce journey can be there. So if you see the first one speaks about the presentation layer. The second one speaks about the service layer. Third one is integration and the fourth is speaking about the benefit of each and every layers right so the first layer speaks about customer journey being on the commerce side so if you see uh, to to let you know under uh, to to make you understand more the dark orange um, is basically uh, wherein you have commerce fulfilling all the journeys and the yellow yeah or i'll say light orange uh, lightish orange or maybe something uh, is is uh, is is where a content journey is coming into play so 
ideally if you ask um, me and this is my personal opinion i would uh, recommend a journey which is either 5 or 6 that is the journey that i would recommend or maybe 4 5 and 6 based on the requirements and the needs within wherein uh, some is hybrid and some is completely uh, the content layer is the complete glass layer that you are having on the front end so this slide basically um, gives the advantages of each and every offerings that we have and i think uh, i am on time maybe and um, i think this is my this is the last slide that i want to highlight to you all um, these are some of the important uh, urls wherein uh, i feel that um, this should be a take away from uh, from my presentation wherein i would really request you all to go and read about graphql and uh, as migul said maybe go and contribute to it this can be another uh, another approach that you can go and do a contribution uh, sif connector uh, this week all as con uh, commerce integration framework Uh, this is the framework or the integrator which actually helps connecting aem and magento you can have it on github you can go and see about it magento association so guys uh, i was looking into this today and i am really very happy it's not paid yet if you are not a member be a member today don't miss it out i am not sure uh, when the membership starts on it but you have to be there uh, you would also start getting uh, Uh, some discount coupons on, on being a member and being a member you actually are contributing in lots of way to the magento community and the last is basically um, about how graphql interacts and and some of the urls wherein you can go and learn about the graphql with that i think i come to the question and answer session i will stop my screen share now and uh, i am now open for question and answers and i hope that was not too boring definitely not boring at all uh, vikram thank you so much for the session guys uh, the question and answer uh, option is open for you so if you have questions you can just start posting it there and vikram will help you out no the headless journey will always be with other cms so basically if you see my presentation it i was talking more about adobe commerce cloud so adobe commerce cloud as i said comes with four product offering one is aem uh, adobe target um, um analytics and magento so that is where i was coming web and talking about more from the adobe commerce standpoint but if you ask me from the magento standpoint we already have a lot of uh, products and offering which are um which are actually working headless uh, to name the few of them obviously the pws studio of magento being the first one uh, the second one is vuejs git uh, scanded web there are many others which are in the market and people are free to use any of them right so so i think uh, we are not going to restrict it just to aem uh the second question magento is not going to support payment gateway module which does not support whether this it will affect the shell to um, um it will whether the shell of magento can we so basically that is why magento um, and ashish uh, so ashish question is that um, we are removing payment gateway modules from magento and that would actually impact merchants so basically you would have to tell your merchants that they now have to go and take the magento uh, they have to take the payment gateway modules from marketplace so the reason is that magento um, going towards the more of a monolithic structure wants uh, the payment gateway module to keep them up to date and uh, ensure that they are they are pci compliant right and uh, i think that's the best way onwards because if you want paypal module to be up to date i think it should be paypal's responsibility not magento's uh, responsibility right so i think that's 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 a perfectly wise decision considering the monolithic structure the rim going away from the monolithic and the modular structure that we want to go any public key use cases available on cif yes we have um, uh, we have couple of use cases maybe i think you should go to the uh, github that i shared uh, shridhar uh, gampa and i think you should find uh, some over there and uh, some are also listed on uh, the adobe website in the use cases section vivek kumar asks uh, will the adobe sensei be integrated into the regular mysql search engine or will it uh, integrated into elastic search engine um well very weak i have not gone much into the um, the integration side of it but as i believe it it would actually support the uh, the elastic search engine because that is what we are recommending as a um, as a core um, 
let's say like a best use case to go ahead with and uh, with that i'll just take one minute more to maybe surprise few of you um, by saying this uh, because i know last time i asked in one of the meetup and most of them answered it wrong so i'll just take one minute and i'll ask a very quick question and i want you guys to answer it in the chat box the question is um, what according to magento is the best practice for uh, data storage in magento uh, database is it flat table or is it eav model what is the best practice that magento recommends okay so i am getting a lot of eav 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 uh, there is one guy which says uh, ashish uh, says flat table uh, there is another so who says suresh who said flat table great so let me surprise you all uh, it's flat table it's not eav if you go with if you go with the um, and i think that is why i asked this and i think uh, most of you uh, need to go and read the dev docs and that is what um, migul was trying to highlight see with all of these changes that we are doing into the software magento as a core software there are different uh, the 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 dev docs are getting um, updated day in day out right and flat table it's not since today since the launch of 2.3 uh, flat table is the recommended practice from magento and it's available on dev docs oh great i was i was worried that most of you would uh, answer it as flat table <laughs> anyways uh, another question b2c has any feature of recommended product um, yeah um, the old one stays as it is binu um, yeah, adobe sensei is just for uh, adobe sensei is just for the commerce uh, features uh, adobe commerce cloud actually thank you for presenting such a great uh, lecture no it's not a lecture we are not professors kesav we are just normal human being like you uh, does magento support uh, local indian payment gateway yes it does uh, you can always find extensions uh, available in there uh, richard ask um, vikrant can you suggest to merchant to opt um, for a adobe commerce cloud before the development of the website see adobe commerce cloud comes with aem analytics and all other things right so uh, so if you are trying to if you are having a customer whose content journey is the premium journey for them and who are basically um, who are basically uh, looking to go ahead with um, uh, you are you are basically going to look ahead um, looking to go ahead with the commerce journey that is uh, content journey that is where you want to uh, take them um how does adobe commerce ensure gdpr so basically um shrishidhar we have basically a um, lot of other mechanism to ensure gdpr and that we we are hosted in all the other places uh, to min maintain the gdpr um, offerings and maybe that is something i can certainly uh, give more answers to you offline maybe you can connect with me on linkedin and we can i can actually help you out with that so thank you so much um, we're looking forward to more sessions from you masters in the following weeks as well so uh, moving on um, we have uh, the customer success manager here with us uh, dc caps customer success manager is tim uh, timothy dip and uh, he has a few words to share along with you tim over to you let me share a link with you guys. You guys are all invited. Um, it's great to see the community with you guys with the Magento side of things. So uh, with DCCAB, uh, we are a platform analysis. So we are working with uh, Big Commerce as well. So this, this e-summit that we're hosting, uh, originally it was supposed to be for, um, for Cleveland, Ohio. So this one is gonna be during the same time, but uh, it'll be virtually um, you know, all online. So you guys are more than, more than welcome to come here. Uh, looks like, Actually, I can share my screen now. There we go. So this is what the website will look will look like. So this will be on April twenty eighth at nine fifteen a.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you're in the Pacific time, this is the uh, six fifteen. And then uh, you know all the information will be here. So we have speakers from uh, you know the VP of Sales from Big Commerce, Joel Pearson. Um, also with George uh, Gorgeous, That's another speaker that we have. We uh, we also have Avalara. Uh, so Jordan Carpenter from there. 
and then uh, you know some some guys from our team. So and we're also going to have a a yoga session uh, brought to you by Cali. So just a little stretch break. But um, um, for this time, it's going to be a very special celebration. We're we're doing a launch website launch party for JIS Division of Jurgens um, from the from their team and have a discussion panel and how you know what the requirements were for to build up the website, how to implement it with uh, integration with P21. So it's gonna be very exciting and you know, hopefully you all could join. Right. And thank you all speakers and uh, the organizers for doing this. Thank you so much.